holy Jiminy Jellicas, why start with Tim Burton's original Batman movie when you can jump straight to Joel Schumacher's absolute cinematic masterpiece, Batman Forever? This and more on the latest that song from that movie. Remember the Bat 2C? <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer. You have to imagine now it's doing the uh, dance moves there. I really don't want to. No, you do. Thank you for joining that song from that movie, The Journey Through the Very Best and Worst of Movie Songs. I am your buffoonery sanctioning host, Dietrich, and we're joined by his really quite bright, despite what people say, Alex. Oh, wow. Well, that's, I, I think that's a compliment. That's the first time I've had a compliment from you in a long time. I felt like we switched at some point, <laughs> and I was getting the bad ones, but I'll take it. Yeah, it was it weren't Ben type complaining. I'm not looking forward to this. And he's the Batman to Alex and mine's Robin, Ben. Yeah, I'll go with that. Oh. Is it the Bat-Nipple Bat Bat version? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're the Bat-Nipple. <laughs> I'm just the n- left one, please. So it's been a while since we last recorded, so uh, when I asked this question, what have you been watching? Uh, it could be a lot of stuff. So, what have you been watching? Um, oh God, I can't remember when I actually last recorded. I wish to film the portrait of the lady on fire, which was very good at one point. Um, that is a, a, a high, that's a highbrow film. Yeah, but it's the only film I can remember watching in the last <laughs> six months that wasn't Toy Story one, two, three, um, or the, the the Padding Paddington one or Paddington two, which I've just been watching on repeat. Very, very similar films. Uh... <laughs> I remember lots of lesbian undertones in in Paddington. <laughs> well, Paddington two maybe, but yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, um, the superior Paddington. They're both By very far. good. Oh yeah, they're both very good. Yeah, but still, Paddington 2 is fantastic. Obviously, some crossover with our today's episode with Nicole Kidman appearing in the first uh, Paddington film. Do you already knows what I've watched recently because I saw Spooderman at the cinema, which was, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I, I thought it was good too. Alex, have you seen it? I have not seen it. I've not, I've not been to the cinema. I've been to the cinema once in the last three years. Yeah, that was the first time I've been since... Oh, I saw June. Oh, yeah, June? 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 Yeah. In the past three weeks, June? I've been to the cinema three times. Ooh, Ooh God. Yeah. Seen Spider Man, saw the new Matrix movie, and I saw the new Kingsman movie. Okay, give um, us a give us a one word for all three. What as in one word per film or one word to sum of all <laughs> yes, three? No, yes, yeah, one yeah, word one, per one, film. One word per film. <laughs> okay. Spider Man fun. Matrix Resurrections fun. <laughs> Kingsman oh sorry, the Kingsman. Yeah. I thought you were going to say not fun. <laughs> okay. That's two words. I think we need. I think we need to get dear thesaurus for Christmas. Fun, okay. fun. Yeah. So to celebrate the release of some upcoming superhero movie or TV show, we are breaking down the songs of Batman Forever. So to find out what was happening in the world when the movie came out. Time for some history. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you for the reverb, Alex. We're going back to June 1995, and it wasn't that interesting of a month. So I've decided to look at what other films were out at the time, because that always interests me. And it was quite... I don't know if it just... Every time I look, it looks like it was a good month. And I don't know if if we looked back around this these times in the 2020s and stuff, we'd still think the same. But what do you think of these? So Apollo 13, good film. Fun. Judge Dredd, amazing film. Fun. Mm-hmm. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The film. The film, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sad. <laughs> Pocahontas. <laughs> yeah. Great song. A film we will definitely cover at some point. And then the greatest film ever, Hologram Man. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of Hologram Man. <laughs> nope. Nope. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to give you the uh, synopsis here. Are you ready? Are you, are you, buckled, are you buckled in? Drink in hand. In yes. fact, no, put the drink down because you're going to throw it. It's going to be a spit take. <laughs> Okay. Five years after the mad terrorist Slash Gallagher was sentenced to holographic stasis, he is given a parole hearing. But an equipment failure engineered by his cronies transforms the criminal into a living hologram with godlike powers. Now, stopping him (laughs) is up to (laughs) to Code (laughs) Decoder. The man who, as a police rookie, was responsible for arresting Gallagher in the first place. Now that's decoder, not as the the state. Decoder is like oh, as decoder. someone who decodes things. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> a 
Have you watched I've it? Please it. tell me. You I've got it. I've got it on DVD. Oh my god! <laughs> I've got it in my. They, Arrow. they, they wait. They did a DVD release of this film. Blu-ray. <laughs> Blu-ray. Yeah, Arrow Video. I told you these. Uh, isn't right next to uh, Lords of Frogtown and um, god. what is that one show? Frankenhooker. Mm. Uh, there were, oh, by the way, there was also a Baywatch Forbidden Paradise came out that month. Uh, the cinematic version of Baywatch, which was, the plot was, the fun and romance is threatened when Matt is stung by a fish and captured by Hawaiian villagers. Wasn't that the movie that was shot entirely in slow motion and won <laughs> Pamela Anderson her first Oscar? <laughs> it probably was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just like these films, it just there was loads. Heat Seeker, a kickboxing champion is forced to fight cyborgs in a tournament when the company kidnaps his fiance. What, why, aren't, why aren't these made anymore? <laughs> Hologram Man, Heat Seeker, I could do without Baywatch. But sorry, guys, the uh, the podcast is only downhill from here. So we'll move on to talking about what we're supposed to be talking about, which is Batman Forever. Uh, so yeah, for those uninitiated, Batman Forever is a 1995 American superhero film directed by the late Joel Schumacher and produced by Tim Burton and is the third installment of the Warner Brothers initial Batman film series. So this time we've got Val Kilmer in the... Is this, wait, is this bat nipple Batman? Yes, this no. is... Oh, is this not... Well, he definitely has bat nipples in this one. I think this one has bat nipples. I don't think they're... Uh, it's it's the cold that comes with Dr. Freeze, I think, that really sharpens the George Clooney ones. Clooney-Tang definitely has the famous bat nipples. Right, okay. So yeah, we've got Val Kilmer replacing Michael Keaton as the Bruce Wayne Batman, alongside Tommy Lee Jones, Jim Carrey, Nicole Kidman, and let's not forget Chris O'Donnell. Most people do forget Chris O'Donnell. <laughs> How could you? <laughs> Let's be honest, that, that is an absolutely stacked cast. It is, it is. Chris O'Donnell had a very weird... Like He was. He felt like he was in everything. Like, Is he in Centre for Woman? Is that Chris O'Donnell? Yeah, it is. It is yeah. It? But that yeah. was before he was in this, though. Okay. Is is he in Is he in Dead Poets Society or Chris O'Donnell? Uh, oh, I don't think he... I don't know if he's in that. But he's definitely yeah. is in Centre for Woman, which is similar films in some ways, both sound like <laughs> weird preppy <laughs> campuses. <laughs> It is, yeah. Batman, blind man, yeah. I'm okay, going to take so a flame and throw it in this place. <laughs> <Ooh -ah. laughs> um, what a crock of shit. <laughs> have you seen Scent of a Woman? No. Oh, it's got a classic uh, slow motion, uh, slow motion um, clap in a courtroom <laughs> scene, you know, when everything's silent and one person stands up and starts clapping. But he also drives a Ferrari at one point. But he's blind. Yeah, he's blind. He's blind. <laughs> Only with Chris O'Donnell directing. Anyway, again, we getting, direct, uh, getting misdirected from Batman Forever, which is about Batman trying to stop Two Face and the Riddler in their villainous schemes to extract confidential information from all the mines in Gotham City and use it to learn Batman's identity and bring the city under their control. So, thoughts, guys? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of this movie. To the extent that I'm more than happy to proclaim on this podcast that it's the best big screen Batman movie so far, I guess. I Wait, guess it could all, be better in the future. Them. Of all of them. Okay. So including the Nolan films, including the 1960s spin-off movie. Ooh. Including the Justice <laughs> I like League how movies. That, that's triggered, Alex. Not anything to do with, yeah, with well. the Nolan. <laughs> Can accept maybe that it might be better in some ways than Christopher Nolan, but not the 60s. I mean, the scene. What about the animated the films? Day. Uh, the not including the, the films. Is, is That's fantastic. a fair point. That's a fair point. Yeah, and obviously Lego Batman. Also Lego Batman. I, I will change it to best live action okay. Batman. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, a bit, basically for me, Batman Forever is the, it's the Batman movie that gets the tone and feel right across the entire board. Like Bruce Wayne's lack of emotion, the campiness, his relationship to Robin. Alfred feels like an actual old man <laughs> who just wants the best for Bruce. Who, who is than... Alfred in this one? Was it again? Cause I've, I've, just, I've just rewatched them all. Old man. It's, it's the guy who's in the Michael Keaton ones, and he's in this one, and he's in Batman and Robin. Oh, it's just that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, yeah, I know what you mean. It's not Michael Keaton. I will not bury another Batman. I will not bury another Batman. <laughs> <laughs> she was only six years old. <laughs> Some men just want to watch a world burn. Anyway, continue. Sorry, should I continue? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Alfred feels like an old man who just wants the best for Bruce, which is what he should be, rather than more of a rounded character like Michael Caine is. I don't want a round character. Um, <laughs> Gotham City feels like it's an actual place rather than just New York City. But also it's not as cartoony as like Batman and Robin, where there was like sort of multicolours just like splattered on walls. So do you like the the first two Batmans, the Burton Batmans? 
uh, I like the first one, and I'm okay on the second one. Okay. And this is probably the most important bit, especially for me as a child. It's easily, without question, and it, I don't think it'll ever be beat. It's the best Batmobile of any Batman movie. I 100% agree. I've got that yeah, in my notes. Yeah. It's the best Batman I've, I've literally right here, it's a cold hard fact. It's not it's bright. cold hard fact. <laughs> fact, as Rafa Benitez would say. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I had the toy version. I had the toy version. I, I don't know if it was from a McDonald's or something like that, but I kept it for a long time. I, I feel sorry for kids today that get like the, uh, what's it called, like the tumbler. That's the Batman. worst. That is the worst Batmobile by miles. That tumble and it's like it's just so boring. It's like essentially just a tank, and it's all like black. Yeah, it's like somebody stepped on a Hummer. Yeah, it's like where's the blue neon light? <laughs> it's a wheel. Yeah, where's the flames? Where's, where's, where's the, the flames? Point? Where's the the, the the pointless like fins, like shark fins? Respect yeah. the brackets. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> uh, were you aware of like the controversy around the second Batman and McDonald's? No. Nope, I'm assuming it was too dark. Yeah, well, yeah, I think because the film is really... Well, yeah, it's quite dark in points, the second one. Um, yeah. it, the tone of it didn't really match from what was in A Happy Meal to uh, what the film was like, so I think they wanted it to be a lot lighter so they could market it more to kids. Hence why the film is like this. I think Tim Burton was getting too dark. Yeah, um, should I continue saying how great it is? If you want, if you've got more content. I love Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, which, in my opinion, is a better, aesthetically pleasing look and more believable looking Two-Face than the Dark Knight CGI mush face. <laughs> and it's got a more believable backstory, too, in this movie. What is it? But acid. Yeah, it's always acid. Acid, acid can't work for everything. You're always falling a vat of something. <laughs> a vat of eels. And a vat of eels, yeah, exactly what, I'm, that's not exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, was it like one of the people who he'd got? Convicted through acid in his face or something. Yeah, it was in the courtroom, wasn't it's it? It's the same. It's the same guy from. Because like he holds up like a piece of paper, like no. <laughs> yeah, it's the same guy from the Dark Knight, though, isn't it? I can't Harvey Dent. The name. The... No, as in the mafia guy who does the damage. Oh right, yeah, yeah, Kingpin. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's not let's not go into this cartoon crossovers. Uh, yeah, so Tommy Lee Jones is for an actor who we see is this grumpy, set in his way old man who doesn't like fun. It's such a large performance from Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> Just like the way he moves his face and his body. It's essentially only second to Jim Carrey himself. Who Tommy Lee Jones which, hated. Put, who puts in like a career performance. <laughs> yeah, he is good. He is good in this. He is very good. Essentially, this this character, his performance as Riddler uh, or Edward Dingmer, is what so many movies have tried to replicate since this. Like Guy Pearce's character in Iron Man 3 or... Jamie Foxx's Electra, like they're all trying to be this Riddler character <laughs> and this performance. Yeah. So, uh, without going uh, any further, because I feel like I'm stepping on everyone's toes here, it's the best live-action Batman movie so far. Do we remember what Tommy Lee Jones said to Jim Carrey? Well, I did reference it in the intros. Oh, you did, didn't you? <laughs> Buff- Do you remember Alex? <laughs> no, no, I don't actually. No, go on. Even if you reference it in the intros. Go on, Ben. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. It's that now that sounds like Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, that that's that's the grumpy man. But like when the camera started rolling, his performance was nothing like that. Yeah. Although I wish his two face character had said that. <laughs> yeah, he could have done. Alex. I also love this film. But I don't think it's necessarily a good film, but I just really enjoyed watching it again. I just think it's like out of all of the Batman films, but also just like superhero films in general, especially nowadays. This is this one's just the most fun to watch because it's just like ridiculously chaotic and frenetic and and, pre- and also like larger than life, stupid in a lot of ways. But that's what makes it so good. But also makes it what yep. like a comic book film because I feel like they try almost to make it everything just fit into a real world almost now, and it's like where well, this is just like it's completely just its own crazed place of of like frantic energy where stuff is just happening constantly so yeah i just i just i just love it i put i love the 90s batmobile definitely my favorite one had a massive toy of it in uh, my house and it lit up as well which was great um the other thing i found about this film is like it's not just batman's like nipple suit which he because it was definitely the thing i know he does have this one yeah i've just looked it up yeah it's it's like one of the yeah, very very yeah. first scenes is like a close up of the nipples, <laughs> but generally this film like it's funny what you were saying about McDonald's because I just felt that this film was like essentially just like sex on real, like it was just like <laughs> everything about it is just bondage and a bit sexual. Yeah. So it's just like it's weird that you said because like obviously the 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 first two are a bit like that as well, but they're a bit more darker in terms of the story. Whereas this one, it's just like there's that part in the middle where 
there's just like Two Face just has like two women, one of which is Drew Barrymore, which was like when I was watching, I was like, "What's happening?" Because <laughs> uh, this hasn't been that long after ET. Like, how many years after ET is this? But anyway, yeah, and Drew Barrymore's quite famously, I guess, was opened up to probably a lot more than a child should have been opened up to in Hollywood. Yeah, well, that shows in this uh, film because you can't have been very old, and it's just like, why does Two Face just have like essentially two like 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 an angel and devil like prostitutes essentially as well i can assume what they are and then all of a sudden edward nigma takes one of them as well <laughs> don't understand this plot line but then like it's just it's all just a bit like creepy and, and yeah sexual which which i thought was interesting don't ask questions alex just eat your chicken nuggets yeah yeah so as we were saying it, this film moved on or attempted to move on from the sort of dark dystopian atmosphere um, and it lent more on the comics and the TV show elements of the 60s. Wasn't as camp as, yeah, Batman and Robin would be, uh, but it was Bing. definitely on the way to being. Michael Keaton famously said um, initially when he was offered this, the script sucked. The script was never good. I couldn't understand why he wanted to do what he wanted to do. I knew it was in trouble when Joel Schumacher said, why does everything have to be so dark? <laughs> I mean, he's right. But then it goes too far in Batman and Robin. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I'm I'm of the opinion, like, I think the, I do think the Nolan ones are generally better, but the first Batman, I think it's the best of the original ones. And then I, I think it's, for me, it steadily goes downhill. I probably enjoy this one more, a lot, but I think it's going downhill. It falls off a cliff very quickly after this, but it's definitely going downhill. But yeah, the film received mixed views at the time. A lot of praise went to the set pieces and the design of everything. Uh, and the performances of Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones. But there was a lot of criticism of the CGI, which is really poor. Like, it, I th- it's one of those glass shattering moments. Maybe you can't think How of it, but when you go. You. No, you go back and watch it. Some of the, like, the almost like there's like transition shots through the city. It's, it feels <laughs> like, it feels like that thing. You remember when you used to go to the cinema and before the film started, there used to be that helicopter flying through the city. And it used to be playing like a wailing guitar <laughs> oh, yeah. music. Do you remember what I'm on about? Yes. Yeah, it's exactly that. That's Gotham, <laughs> and then I think you flew into like the cinema at the end. Uh, it's like being on some sort of like four D roller coaster. Anyway, there was a lot of criticism for the CGI, and people generally critics didn't like the tonal shift. I think because I guess the first two worked so well, there was a lot of people wondering why such a big change. Um, McDonald's, that's why. McDonald's was were the first two directed by Joel Schumacher as well. No, the first two were directed by Tim Burton. So he actually directed them, Tim Burton. I didn't know whether he was yeah. just because he was producing a lot of films at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Well, he still, he still produced this one because there was a lot of criticism that the second was was really dark. And I guess Batman historically had been a, you know, a kid's a teen. It's very lighthearted. As, so they wanted it to go back to that because it was hard to market. Mm. Um, but it was a box office success. 336 million worldwide became the sixth highest grossing uh, of the year. Which I don't know if that's a, an achievement. <laughs> it's not really a claim for a film as big as this, is it? <laughs> it's always written as like an achievement, and I'm like, sixth, yeah. Um, well, it depends what the five before it. Well, we know one was that hollow thing. Yeah. So, what were the other four? Well, presumably, Poke on this was probably one of them. <laughs> if you mentioned that, uh, right? yeah, yeah. Heat Seeker, Baywatch, Forbidden Paradise, uh, and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. There you go. Yeah, I mean, well, then. it's hard to be. Wait, so the, ba- the Baywatch film. <laughs> I'm joking, Alex. I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you were being serious. <laughs> the benefits of you not being able to see my face cracking up as I as I attempt to read my notes on Hologram Man, and I keep seeing <laughs> the red underlined because I spelt Kurt Dakota wrong. <laughs> so keep on the same theme of the Dakota from whatever that film's called. Hologram Man. Uh, I think Hologram Man. Uh, I think the the scene where Bruce Wayne is figuring out who Riddler is <laughs> is an all time perfect movie scene. It is amazing. It uh, has incredible pacing, scripting, <laughs> and it has great character work between Bruce and Alfred. I, I've got the uh, the quote here. If you want me to go through it, I do. I do want you to. I, oh, it's going to ruin my end uh, segment because I was going to use it as my end quote, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so Bruce Wayne. Where five little items of everyday sort, you'll find us all in a tennis court. In. A-E-I-O-U. Vowels. Not entirely unclever, sir. But what do a clock, a match, chess pawns, and vowels have in common? What do these riddles mean? <laughs> Every riddle has a number in question, and they arrived at this order. Thirteen, one, eight, and five. Thirteen, one, eight, and five? What do they mean? Perhaps letters of the alphabet? <laughs> 
Of course. Th- 13 is M. A would be... 1 would be A, 8 would be H, and 5 would be E. M, A, H, E? Perhaps 1 and 8 are 18. 18 is R. M, R, E. How about Mr. E? Mystery? Another word for mystery? Enigma. Mr. E. Enigma. Edward Enigma. Stickley's suicide was obviously a computer-generated forgery. You really are quite bright, no matter what people say. <laughs> I remember when I was watching the oh, film, man. this was the part I was looking forward to the most. <laughs> it's just that last bit. Another name for mystery? Enigma. <laughs> Mr. E. Enigma. I always thought, I, I always had it in my head that he actually went, Mr. E. Enigma. Edward Enigma. The Riddler. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about I think modern films have like gotten away from the sort of the problem solving almost like um red string style because it's just all computerized now. Whereas back in the especially in the eighties and nineties when films were trying to be more clever, they didn't know how to do it. <laughs> oh, like I say it always reminds me of the Mission Impossible first one when he's trying to guess the password for the like, laptop and he can't. Oh, and yeah. he just looks and there's a pic there's a picture above it of the like what is it, the most secure, richest man going and his password is the picture that's above his computer. <laughs> and he just types it in. <laughs> it's like boat. <laughs> No capitals or anything, no numbers, it's just the word, and he guesses it like the third time. <laughs> well, that's what, that's what I love about this scene, yeah, definitely. It's just like how quickly he was solved it. <laughs> it's like, it seems to make no sense, and then it, within two seconds it's solved, and he knows who the Riddler is. <laughs> As if it wasn't already obvious. I mean, because he's wearing the thinnest little mask, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so stupid. <Ugh. laughs> but also amazing. Yeah. First question, guys. Which famous, very famous musician lobbied to get the role of Ed Nigma? I'm going to guess Michael Jackson. It was Michael Jackson, yes. Oh, I was going to say David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> David Bowie, I think, would have worked. Michael Jackson yeah, would have been good, I think. Michael yeah, Jackson. Yeah, it just reminds Definitely. me of him trying to get the uh, Agent M uh, in Men in Black Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did he also want to be Spider Man? Maybe he oh, just, he, knowing him, he probably just tried to do everything. I thought that was Jose Mourinho. <laughs> that is a callback. That is a callback. Go listen to the so, one of our Spider-Man episodes if yeah. you uh, want to know what he means. <laughs> if you want to understand that bizarre reference. <laughs> so yeah, the film had both its original score by Elliot Goldenthal and the soundtrack, which featured the songs we will discuss today. So Joel Schumacher, the director, reportedly wanted a more pop-based album to appeal to the masses, I guess. And despite all the adverts and commercials leading up to the film using the famous Danny Elfman Batman score, he wanted something different. He decided to go with this soundtrack with a lot more of well-known names. So there's five songs of the soundtrack featured in the movie, two of which we will go into detail. Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me by U2 and Kiss From a Rose by Seal. I also recommend, in your own time, listeners, going and listening to The Riddler by Method Man, because it's it's, it's a doozy. Um, <laughs> I don't think it features in the film, but it's, it's, it's great. So yeah, the film soundtrack did pretty well, but it didn't reach the sale figures of Prince's original Batman soundtrack. So it will always be lesser. First song we're going to talk about today is Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me by U2. So, for those unaware of this band, uh, they are an Irish rock band, apparently, called <laughs> U2. Um, it was released as a single from the Batman Forever soundtrack on the 5th of June, 1995, and it was a number one single in the UK and in the home country of Ireland, as well as seven other countries. And it reached uh, number 16 in the US Billboard Hot 100, number one on the Billboard Album Rock Tracks, and the Modern Rock Tracks Charts. That is a mouthful. What do you think of this song, guys? So, was this song the the song? It from was this the film? song. Yes, it was officially yeah. the spoke. Well, it was supposed to be the official song. Uh, unfortunately, the next song took off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I've ne- until until I heard it come on in the credits because it it came on like the first song in the credits, which made me think it must be the main song for the film. I feel like I'd never heard this song before in my life. What? Yeah. I'm not. I mean, I'm not a U2 fan by <gasps> stretch, <laughs> and I knew that you would realize that. But I'm, I'm not really. But I mean, this song, what it did sound like, was a soundtrack song for a '90s film. That is exactly <laughs> what it sounded like. 
and I kind of enjoyed it. It's nowhere near as good a song as the other one, <laughs> so I can see why the other song took off and this one didn't really. Although you said it got to number one, which surprised me a lot. But it was, yeah, it felt like, yeah, this is the kind of song that ended every action movie in the 90s. Except this time it's sung by you 2 instead of someone that you've never heard of. <laughs> Go on, Dave. So for me, the, the best Batman movie has to have the best U2 song. It's just a, a cool as... Have we sworn this episode yet? Uh, I, I, yeah, probably. Okay, it's a cool as fuck song. <laughs> we had not uh... It's It's probably the only time U2 have released a song which, which isn't designed to appeal to your parents. Like, <laughs> it's not like Beautiful Day that's going to appear on like a Top Gear album or Now That's Why I Call Driving Down the Motorway or Advert for a Bang. Or the, champi- or the Championship. <laughs> really, really, really triggering me here. Yeah, I, I just love like the sort of like nineties vocoder vocals and the computerized guitar sound. You know, as in like the the noise, the, the famous yeah, the famous <laughs> and the famous edge sound. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait uh, what do you say? Can I say can I say famous edge sound, or do I have to say famous the edge sound? Does he have the? the... Yeah, you have to say famous the edge sound. Well, I did. I did think you were saying like you think you know me, and okay. I was like, <laughs> is that in that song? <laughs> Spear. Um, so, yeah, so despite not having many examples th- I can think of, uh, when I think of this style, it just takes me back to the music of my youth. Uh, but seeing as I can't think of a single example, maybe that's one of, one of these fabricated memories, like a Mandela effect, yeah, where yeah, I feel yeah. like this is a very <laughs> 90s thing, but I can't think of any other 90s song that uses it, other than maybe Cher, believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you watch the music video for this one? I did, yes. Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think the music video is banging. <laughs> it's a very cool music video. Yeah, it's like they went, okay, you two, we want you to record a music video for your Batman movie song. And they went, what if instead of us performing, we just hire those guys that created the Burger King Kids Club and just <laughs> have them do it? I don't think I saw the same video. The one I saw was just like, what? just clips from the film. Uh, n- oh, did it not man. have like loads of animation in it? No. Animated Bono. The <laughs> no. <laughs> what, oh, Alex? We need, we almost need to pause this. Do I have to pause the pause? Just put it, can, you, can you put it on the side on your, your phone? Silent. Yeah, and you yeah, phone watch it. Silent. Keep going, D. Yeah, well, yeah. And then the person in charge went, sure, yeah, let's do that. But um, can we at least have uh, some generic footage from one of your, one of your live tours? And then just mashed it all together. <laughs> <laughs> as Alex was about to see. We'll have to hear like, his, like, his live thoughts as he sees it. <laughs> <laughs> we did that, didn't we, when I watched uh, that one from uh, Star Trek? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this is anime, but surely this can't be it. Anime or animated? Uh, well, it's a bit <laughs> Cause of Because if, if it's very anime, <laughs> it's probably some sort of like OVA. Like, no, it's anime. It's got like a yellow... It's like quite yellow. There's bats flying around. I think does, I think does Bono die in it, and then there's like the the Faustian character hanging over. There's like him. a character wearing like a yellow yeah, coat. Yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. That that's good. supposed to be Bono. That's supposed to be Bono. Where's his glasses? <laughs> Where's the glasses? <laughs> oh yeah, because I the think edge. the glass. I think the glasses came late. Um, so oh, yeah, I think this basically <laughs> <laughs> we get guys. We're getting a live play by play. No, you guys keep talking. I'll keep watching. <laughs> So yeah, basically, D. Um, similar to how you're saying, you two were were incredibly successful, especially in the early days. But had gotten criticism that they, well, they didn't have that sort of star power. So they decided to try and get a more anthemic sound that was kind of in their music, a bit like this. It is a big anthem, but they tried to add more to their live performances. And you two have become quite famous for their live performances now. Yeah, a lot of that involved around this time. There was the Zoo TV tour which was a U2 tour, in which Bono had various alter egos, uh, of which some of them are contained in this video, of which they have names. The White Duke. (laughs) (laughs) One of them. Uh, (laughs) Alex, the one, you know, the one that looks a bit like the devil. Yes, I'm seeing him. Yeah, he's he's called McFisto. Well, that's an unfortunate name. (laughs) Yeah. Um, There's also uh, Mirabal and The Fly. And apparently he would often come out. So, for example, McFisto, he's wearing like a gold lame suit, gold platform shoes. He'd put pale makeup on, lipstick, devil horns, and then keep going off stage and getting changed into these other characters for his songs. <laughs> it gave him a different... Uh, I want to say different edge, but that's not, <laughs> a, different that's edge. not a pun. The edge, a different I, I edge. Did, <laughs> different <laughs> Is this, wait, is this video just like the same video on repeat several times? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, animation animation was limited back then. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he, he said the song is about being in a rock band and being a star. 
and that's definitely what they wanted. I think the glasses came around this time. I think he's got a, an actual sort of difficulty with his eyes. Glaucoma. Is it is it glaucoma? Yeah. Is that what it he's is? He's got something, isn't it? That's why they're the weird coloured lenses. Yeah. Like Edgar yeah. Davids. Like Edgar Davids, yeah. Yeah. The glasses do appear in this, actually. They're not the coloured ones, just the big black ones. Shades. Yeah. Well, I think they're all related to these characters. So, yeah, they were trying to build this bigger sound, this bigger image. I think they were asked to make this song for the film. It was originally planned that Joel Schumacher was going to create a cameo role for Bono as <laughs> McFisto in oh, Batman wow. Forever as this character. Unfortunately, they both agreed <laughs> that it was not suitable for the film. But as a replacement <laughs> idea, they decided to make the song. So I think there was a time when you were you were contracting you two to be in the film and not to do anything musically with the film. Um, <laughs> so it was very much a, damn, I can't be in the film. All right, here's a song. The Edgewood Nigma. <laughs> I mean, it could have worked, yeah. The the Edgewood Nigma. Um, but yeah, um, the <laughs> the song was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Original Song. It lost to, what do we think it lost to of this year, Alex? Um, Colors of the Wind. Colors of the Wind, yeah. very good, from Pocahontas. Uh, it also received a Grammy Award nomination for Best... <laughs> I can't even say it, I hate the Grammys. It also received a Grammy Award nomination for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal and Best Rock Song. Oh, yeah. And it, only, it was only nominated, it didn't win. It also received a Golden Raspberry Award, D. Did it? For Worst Original Song. Yep. Not Colors of the Wind. It, no, that one an Oscar for best original song. <laughs> so it received a Golden Raspberry nomination. It lost to uh, "Walk Into the Wind" from Showgirls. Was that this year? I know it didn't even fit into my uh, summary of all the films that came out. I guess I did put a lot of time into Hollow Man. So wait, is is McFisto Batman then? Because I feel like at the end of the video, <laughs> him and Batman are trading places. Well, at least listening to Bono in interviews and that one South Park episode. I imagine Bono thought he came up with a very original idea and he didn't realise he was speaking to the director of Batman. <laughs> because it does seem like there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> um, I've got nothing else to say on this one, guys. Let's move on to the Far Superior song. Okay, so we're moving on to the Far Superior song. According to at least two members of this podcast, we will await the third. So yeah, the other song we're discussing is Kiss from a Rose by Seal. Uh, not The Seal, just Seal. Um, <laughs> so Kiss from a Rose is a song that was on Seal's second eponymous album. It was first released as a single in 1994, so before the film. And it was, in fact, included on a different film before this. Do we know what film that is? Dangerous Liaisons. No, you're never going to guess it. Go. Um, never Ending Story 3. <laughs> oh, okay. Weird, it didn't take off. It was re-released a year later in 1995 as part of the Batman Forever film soundtrack. It wasn't given much time. I'm trying to think, D, because I've not actually made a note of this. Where Does it feature in the film? Uh, I don't think it does. I, I think it's a credit actually. song. It didn't feature in the sure actual it... film from my memory when I watched it. I'm pretty sure it's a credit song. song. Yeah, but it got a huge response. So before we go into that, Alex, I'm going to postpone your words around this song. As I'm curious, leaning into my microphone. D, what do you think? I don't know why you're so worried. Like, we've had the best Batman movie, the best U2 song. So it's only right we have the best song of all time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. good. Uh, no, the, the, the best Seal good. song. Everyone's oh. bringing the rare game for this movie. Best, the best Seal. I mean, no offence to Seal. There's, there's not, it's not swimming of competition. Well, it's not like an well I don't know. Good. We've all, well, yeah, we've already had a song by Seal feature in this podcast. Yes, yes it's a very good song. And but also, I don't think it was amazing. amazing. Yeah, so it's, it's haunting, beautiful, heartfelt. Okay, name, Do I need name, to go name on three then? more. Be- name three more songs. Name three more songs. What by to... by Seal or just any songs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sol- well, I mean, obviously the, Solita- the Solitary Brother. I can't, I can't really remember any of this. Yeah. <laughs> you can't remember what the song's called. It's not called Solitary Brother. I know, but you know the song. It's called Killer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Go on, D. Carry on. Delayed vocals. It's just perfect. I mean, do, do I need to go on? Oh God, yeah. He it can melt butter. I want to know how does he perform it live? Because I assume he's doing I mean, all the parts. <laughs> Maybe he does. <laughs> you know, he has like one of those loop machines, so he like starts off singing yeah. a bit and then it comes in with the next. Bit. Like I said, I will reiterate what we said on the Space Jam episode. There's compilations of 
famous musicians yes. surprising street performers in New York and places like this. <laughs> and there's like there's like five or six of them, and about eighty percent is Seal. <laughs> I don't know if he's just walking around New York finding people singing his songs, but he's just always there getting involved. It's funny you say that because because uh, I was after we did that episode where you mentioned that like a few weeks later I was watching like a it was like a concert for Joni Mitchell or something where like lots of people were doing the songs and <laughs> Seal just walks on and performs uh, both sides <laughs> now and he's just like love you Joni like they've been best friends forever <laughs> like where did Seal come from <laughs> were you even invited on Seal <laughs> yeah well, this is it like where does he appear from I think we would be letting so, our audience down by not attempting to do the layered vocal backing track ourselves. Because there's th- <laughs> there's three parts bloody, yeah. and we're, oh, we're is there? yeah there's three three parts to that opening bit and we're not I in the same room that. so it's going to sound hideous, fantastic hideous us all trying to do it at the same time I don't know which bits we'd be doing though I just yeah, I've written I them down <laughs> so there's there's the yeah okay, there's the on. lower uh, body R then there's the bab okay, bab 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 okay there's also an ah I'll take that bit. Yeah, that. So I already written down that Alex will take that bit. Okay. Um, you do the lower, you do lower body out, and I'll do the bad bar. But I'll I'll count in so, so you two know when to start at the God. same time. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm going to take my headphones off so I can't hear you guys. <laughs> that seems fair. So are we all going at the same time? I'll count down. I'll go one, two, and on three, start. Go on. Okay. One, two, three. I took my headphones off. Did it sound amazing? Uh, yeah, it was. It was no. perfect. <laughs> uh, so obviously, because we're doing this online via Zoom, it's going to be a big delay. So I'll put the edited version on now. <laughs> Is it just going to be the seal version? <laughs> Beautiful. We're gonna get copyright struck for that one. It's just okay. uh, Alex has got Alex has got a voice like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> Not there, I didn't. I was I was I was I was just too like put off by the, <laughs> too <laughs> few on a Saturday on a Saturday morning as well. I've not warmed up my vocals. Exactly. Yeah, I need to have a, like a, a le- lemon and honey. Yeah, tea lemon, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Alex, what do you think? It's, I mean, it's a great song, isn't it? Like, there's, 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 I don't, I don't know what you can say. Like, every time you hear it, it's just like you get something new from it. Like, the, we talked about the vocal harmony in that opening bit, but. There's that part that like comes in, so I guess like a pre-chorus where it's just like singing different elements of the song, o- overlaid and overdubbed, and it's just like it's just magical. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like he's got a shouting whisper. Yeah, like the, it's that when he says that the baby bit, it's, it's I don't know, the, just the the delivery of it. It sounds like he's really putting effort in, but it's still quite soft and melodic. I got a question for you guys. When you sing this on karaoke, do you try to do all the layers at the same time? Like you go, I've been. Kiss by your rose. Yeah, yeah, I would do. Yeah. <laughs> I would definitely try and do that. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to go to karaoke again one day because I've got many good memories with you guys doing this. <laughs> Maybe not this song. I used to think there's like a line in verse two where I really didn't know what he said. Is that part where it's like, tell me you're like a growing addiction. Then, like, <laughs> yeah, like, I, know. I still don't have a clue what he said. But, <laughs> but I was like, what did he say? At least that's what he does say. To me, you're like a growing addiction that I can't deny. But I was like, I swear he says the word dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the song topped the charts in the US and Australia. Uh, it reached top 10 in several un- other countries, including Canada, France, Iceland, and Norway. Uh, I don't actually know how it did in this country, but at the 1996 Grammy Awards, it won Record of the Year, Song of the Year, and Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. Bit different f- to being nominated for Best Rock Performance by a duo or group with vocals. It's a shame the Grammys don't mean anything. <laughs> uh, it's not a shame they don't mean anything. It's absolutely fine that they don't mean anything. I think Seal would disagree. Uh, well, you know, he's got a lot of other things going for him, such as this podcast, praising him. I imagine this will go on his mantle first. Um, can, can, can we sell some NFTs? Do they work? Yeah. <laughs> Just our voice on replay. So yeah, originally, Seal did not like the song. He wrote it in 1987, so several years prior to the release of his debut album in 1991. But after he wrote the song, he said he felt embarrassed by it. Oh. And apparently he was—he hated it so much that he just threw the tape of it in the corner. Uh, 
I'm imagining quite a soft throw if you're if it's gone in the corner. <laughs> it's just like a kind of a I'm 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 not I'm <laughs> not mad keen, so I'm just gonna like it. toss it into the corner rather than I just threw it at the wall or anything like that. So some reason in my head what I've got is like him sat in, sat in a wing back chair with like a glass of brandy, like head in the in the other hand. And then he just like Shut up and- <laughs> Yeah, just like smashes it against the wall. That's that's what I've got in my head. There's like a roaring fire. <laughs> yeah, that's how he writes his songs. I think it was quite different to the final release. He's, um, his producer at the time, um, Seal, said, uh, to be honest, I was never really proud of the song. Though after my producer, after what he did with the recording, he turned that tape from my corner, <laughs> I eventually mean my corner in his room, to an 8 million record sales, and my name became a household name. I mean, it's easy when your name is Seal. <laughs> I think that helps. Um, it it's very easy to go in the brain. But yes, I'm also imagining his record producer going into the room he's recording, going into the corner, picking up the tape and just saying, I'll do something with this. <laughs> it was the second single taken from the Batman Forever film soundtrack after the U2 song. And it was it was only number one for one week in the US in August 1995. Um, it reached number four in the UK singles charts. But it was... It had a long-lasting effect. And still to this day, I think, like you say, it does feel like it's a big karaoke song, D. I know the yeah. Community episode always sticks out in my mind when <laughs> Jeff's singing it with the Dean. But it was also nominated for the MTV Movie Award for Best Song from a Movie in 1996. D, do you want to go on to talk about, because a big part of that was the video. Okay, yeah, well, the video is perfection. <laughs> the unbuttoned silk shirt with a wind machine. It's exactly what a movie music video should be. Over the top performance in a location sort of linked to where the movie is with random clips. Does of that the movie. happen any? Does that happen anymore? I it's, feel that's quite rare. Yeah, I don't think I can't even think of the last music video I saw that was actually for a movie. I feel like the song for the Fast and the Furious one, the what's his name, Charlie Puth. Does that? Oh, and Wiz Khalifa. Is that like on? Is that like yeah, and Wiz Khalifa? Is that the one where it's like it's on the road where they're driving at the end? Yeah, well, it's just like a dusty road somewhere. So I don't think okay, it's dusty road. So kind of, kind of, somewhat related. But yeah, yeah, this one he's actually like in front of the bat signal, isn't he? Yeah, I, I can, I can. Is it? It's a hero from Spider Man. That's really similar, isn't it? Because that's like on top of like the building with the wall cooler. Yeah, yeah, it's like. But that's day and night it versions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably inspired by this. I know. It, it might have been a slightly different video if Seal did not have the uh, the physique he does have. <laughs> Or he adopted for a cotton shirt rather than a silk shirt. <laughs> uh, for what uh, for what Alex was saying about how actually sexualized this film is, I'm just imagining some kids just watching this video as well. It's just adding to it. It's layers upon layers. I think what makes it what makes, what makes it actually nipples worse is everywhere. Like, yeah, well that, but also it, you could misconstrue the silk shirt as actually Batman's cape. Like it looks <laughs> like he's like wrapped up in Batman's I think cape. It, maybe maybe that's an intentional. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, I think it probably is because there's plenty of shots in the video of like Batman's cape, cape like whooshing in the wind and stuff. So I think it genuinely is intention. The only other thing that I wanted to mention about the video was there's <laughs> there's a part where Chris O'Donnell like steals the Batmobile in the film. I don't know if you remember that bit, and um, he yes, ends up fighting yeah. like a, like lots of street thugs <laughs> who are yeah. like dressed in like tribal paints and stuff. It's quite random, but like he just like makes out with this random woman. And that part they felt was worth putting in the video. <laughs> it's like <what's laughs> that there. It's like such a minor thing that happens in the film. I'm like, no, we gotta include this. <laughs> it's like they're going, "This isn't your granddad's Robin. He's a ladies' man. <laughs> he rides motorcycles and wears denim jackets." And apparently, he's 17 years old when Chris O'Donnell was probably in his mid 30s. <laughs> yeah. He probably was, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's like, oh, he's an orphan. He has to go live with Bruce Wayne. He's like, he's literally a grown man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the classic thing, isn't it? America, though, America though, how they get rid of around um, like child labour laws. Because like, every high school film in America, they're all like 30. Yeah. I remember as a kid thinking, like, what? <laughs> These like 16 year olds when they're on like the, the football team would be like sort of like 160 pounds, which is pure muscle. And it's like, wait, he's 11? (laughs) (laughs) Top five. So, as we realised, Dee and Alex don't know anything about Seal. Um, We don't know how many songs Seal has. Uh, And so saying that this is his best song uh, is hard to do (laughs) when you don't know much. It doesn't hold much weight. (laughs) It doesn't hold much weight. However, whether we like them or not, we all 
are very much used to you two being plagued into our lives. Um, and so Dee says this is the best U2 song. But I want to know what is the public's favourite or most played U2 song. So I've gone on Spotify and I've found what the top five most played U2 songs because they get a lot of plays. For example, the number one most played U2 song has 652 million plays. And and half of those are my dad. <laughs> Uh, so what are the five most played U2 songs on Spotify? Um, with or Without You, number one. In Yes, With or Without You is number one, Alex. Well done. Okay. Uh, Beautiful Day. Number four. You should be able to get these. Come on, guys. Um, Big U2 one, fans. One. One, number two. That's, yeah. That kind of annoys me. Um, vertigo. Okay. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> it's never going to be there. <laughs> oh, God. I can't remember what the name of it is. The one where he's just like... It's, uh... The Sweeties thing. That's a good song, though. I think that actually that's probably my favourite U2 song. But I bet it's not in their top five. No. Nope. I'm thinking of the one, I think it's on the Joshua Tree, the one... Uh, <laughs> see, he's a closet U2 fan. <laughs> well, I know it's a famous <laughs> Looking at his albums on the... I believe it was on the re-release of the Joshua Tree. <laughs> Alex is looking in the mirror at his back tattoo with the uh, U2 1995 tour. Did they have a song called Bloody Monday, or am I making that? Uh, well, oh, Sunday, Sunday Bloody Sunday. Sunday Bloody Sunday. That's the one. Bloody name, Mondays. Yeah. That sounds like the, uh, <laughs> the, Alan Partridge, the Alan Partridge joke that he makes, where he's like, God, don't you just hate Sundays, you know? You gotta get the kids up, get ready for school. And it's actually about a very serious atrocity in Ireland. Uh, one more, guys. One more. <laughs> Elevation. No. That was a good song. You got with or without you one. Oh, I still haven't found one. what I'm looking for. That's what I'm. Still thinking. haven't found what I'm looking for at number three. Well done, guys. You got an actual top five. I like how we knew not to go for the song in this film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's not the best song. Do you? It is the best song. It isn't. Well, it's because it, it's the one that sounds least like you two. The one, I bet the one that we all had on our phones at some point was the one that they forcefully put on our phones. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was forced onto my iPad. I actually don't think it was forced onto mine. I don't think actually I got it on mine. I had a really Because you had a Zoom. Yeah, Alex. <laughs> right, so now it's time to decide what is the best song from Batman Forever. Is that what we're I doing? <laughs> well, what else would it be? <laughs> song or film, I suppose, but there's two songs, isn't there? There's two songs. Yeah. Either way. So, the answer. Uh, so, Alex, what is the best song from Batman Forever? <laughs> it's Kiss from a Rose. Is by it the Riddler by Method Man? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it sounds who's, the, who's the best Robin, Alex? Who's the best Robin? Yeah. Um, Is this a joke? <laughs> no, I wish it was. <laughs> the singer, the Swedish pop singer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, if that was, it, it should be her. Um, Robin Gibb from the Bee Gees. <laughs> I don't like where your brain was going. What did you go for, Ben? Dick Grayson. Oh, right, okay. Fair enough. I've gone different levels. Now I'm going to pick a song? It's Seal. You two songs, not bad at all, but this is like, we're talking like top tier. I think that's it. Yeah, the U2 song was fine. Even, yeah. even I would admit that. And I bet it still gets snubbed by uh, Rolling Stone's top 500 songs of all time. Both of them get snubbed. Both? Wait, Seal was not in that list? I have, I doubt it. <laughs> judging by then. <laughs> Although, to be fair, they updated it last year, and it is, uh, uh, shall we say, different. Um, because I've often thought, because I've often thought when I'm thinking of the greatest songs of all time, the greatest songs of all time, like, yes, I'd put Missy Elliott in the top 10. Wait, what? <laughs> Well, get your freak on. It's get your freak on. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's a bad well, song. Yeah, that, that, it's a good song. That deserves to be. Yeah, that, that, it's a good song. It's a good song, but it's not top ten of all time. It's an influential song as well. I don't know, Ben. We'll talk about this more next time. So that brings us to another episode of that song from that movie. Let us know which one you think is better. Ben, what is our Twitter handle? At TSFTM Pod. Okay, so you can help the podcast by sharing this. One of the places you can share it is on a random subreddit. Alex, what should the random subreddit be? Um, Edge Adam Copeland. <laughs> You can also help us by leaving us a five-star review, which you can now do on Spotify. So if you listen on Spotify, literally just scroll up and you can hit the five-star. You don't have to write a review either. You can help us by buying merch or a bit going on our Patreon. But it's time for some goodbye. So it's goodbye from myself, goodbye, and goodbye from Alex. Mystery. Mr. E. Nigma. <laughs> Mr. Edward Nigma. That song from that name. <laughs> oh, that, was, that should have been a sign-off. Uh, goodbye from Ben. <laughs> I can't beat that. Yeah, fair enough. So, goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> nice, Alex.
The only other quote that I could find that was funny was like, they wouldn't allow me at a children's picnic or something like that. 